Good afternoon, guys, and welcome to the podcast. I've got a special guest for you today, Dr. Cynthia Rapedo from the Bay Area. And she, her expertise and training is in the education area. And I'm really happy to have her on. I've been, I'm always educating myself and I'm a lifelong learner and happy to have her on the show. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, uh, we, we go by first name, so just call me Chris and um, start by introducing yourself, and I'm excited to dive into the questions. Great. Thank you. So I'm Cynthia Rapedo, and um, I've been in education for over 30 years. I started off with teaching biology, high school biology, then biology and chemistry, biology and chemistry, human anatomy, working with EL students, and then did that for nine years. And then I ended up going into administration with assistant principal for 17 years at a high school, at San Mateo High School, and then transitioned to high school principal at South San Francisco High School. And then retired in 2019. I continued to coach, work with the Cal State East Bay with the teacher education program and coach administrators as they were trying to get their credential. Interesting. Yeah, r really interesting. What sounds like you've had a, a really storybook career in the system. And so what motivated you to pursue educational leadership and share some highlights of your journey from all the you've served various roles within the system? Okay. Yeah. So when I was in the teacher, I wasn't thinking about going to administration. I just thought, how do I transition into going up in the pay scale? Teachers don't make a whole lot of money, but you can get credits and it can move you up the pay scale. And so then I ended up uh, doing the master's program at University of San Francisco with the credential program. And then I took that for a year and um, people found out at the school site, the principal, assistant principal, and they said, Cynthia, why don't you, why don't you help with some of the Wapitaki supervision on campus and giving me all these extra duties. So I kept taking all these extra duties and I thought I could, I could probably do this kind of work. And then... I, one of the classes that we had to do was prepare a resume and apply for positions. And I did it and I thought, oh, I'm not going to get it. I'm not really ready to transition, but I want to try it, but let me see. And then I interviewed and was offered a job and I had to double check with my principal. I said, what do you think? Should I take it? Should I not? What do, what do you think? And he said, yeah, definitely do it because you can always go back into teaching if that's what you want to do because it's a different mindset. So he gave me all these tips. And so that's what, what, what gave me that journey from teaching into administration. And that was a huge learning curve. Thinking that being a teacher is one way of what, there's a lot of work that goes into teaching, but there's a lot of responsibilities of being a, a side administrator. And then I thought about going into the, the, and then again, I thought about getting my doctorate and I was really inspired by Glenn Singleton's work. He did courageous conversations about race and ethnicity and just having those courageous conversations. And I thought, I want to do that. I want to be able to talk about race. I'm Filipino American. I don't even see any Filipino American educators. And I've never even talked about race or ethnicity. So I thought, I might do that. And so when I went back to get my doctorate, it was in multicultural and international multicultural education. And I was ready to transition to teaching at the university, thinking I want to train administrators and teach them what, how they can connect with different groups of ethnic groups. And from there, I finished that program. And one of my mentors said, Cynthia, if you really want to be teaching, if you really want to teach administrators in the admin program, you should become a principal. So you have some credibility. And I just thought, Really? I was ready to transition into the university. They were going to give me an interview and everything. And I already knew the department chair. And then when I applied for the principalship, I did take that on. And then I told the department chair at USF, I just said, I, I think I'm going to take on that principalship position. So that's where that was that fork in the road where I thought, which one do I take? And I'm glad I took that route and became a principal. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, yeah. I used to do a lot of running in the uh, summer training in the, uh, I used to run through uh, USF, a uh, really beautiful 
area. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced during your transition and how did those experiences shape your approach to leadership? Good question. Some of it is the, the, just the role of being assistant principal to principal. There's a lot of information that one needs to know, whether it's, and that's what one of my, what, what the chapters are in my book. It's like finance, budget, the important document, building those relationships, know your campus, know the ins and outs of everything, know how to, you know, create groups and build capacity, know the parents. There's a lot of that. And then at the same time, some of the challenges for me, I thought were, okay, being a woman, being Filipino-American, part of it is that, what is that? Kind of the perceptions of and expectations of being a Filipino-American and saying, step out of that role and just say, just be an administrator. I have to be able to give those critical feedback. It's not always about being polite and those stereotypes of being Filipino-American or Asian-American, taking on that. And then, of course, my, just my upbringing. My dad was in the military. That's how we came to the United States. And there's the hierarchy of respect, authority, so that's also part of the culture and just being able to step out of that and uh, be the leader. Yeah. One thing that I really, you know, cause we're going to talk so many, cause you talk to, you talk about a race, which is a very emotionally charged topic. There's the school culture. So one thing to talk about this is San Francisco, especially has a very large uh, Asian population. And when I lived there. Or the summer, you know, you can feel that people are very educated. Like they're just, they're well-to-do and it's a affluent uh, city. You, San Francisco probably doesn't have the same problems as probably like Detroit or these other cities. When you talk about education, what are some of the educational challenges in the system? Because a lot of people now these days, they're not having kids, one, one thing. And the second thing is if they have kids, they either homeschool them because they feel like they're, uh, their ch children's educational needs are not being met. And especially with uh, China and India and a lot of competition, a lot of uh, countries that have really great school systems. So talk about the kind of the healthcare or not healthcare, but educational system in the United States and what you noticed. And if, if uh, the state of California is doing anything to improve, uh, I'm just, I just want to see an insider's perspective because he's had such a storybook career. So I think in terms of educators, I think um, that's where it starts, right? Mm -hmm. If you have good leaders, then you can promote good teachers and then you can promote good schooling. So it all stems from good leadership and those high, not just high expectations, but even coaching administrators, um, coaching teachers, how to become better and not expecting them to always stay in that career, but to maybe move up into that into leadership. So I think that's really important. And then in terms of working with the kids, part of it is providing access, providing resources for students, because the standards are all about making sure that students have accessible, things are accessible to them, whether they're emerging bilinguals or they're students with special needs. So with all students and at the same time, training teachers how to teach all these students that have different learning needs and abilities. And that part is the equity part of education. So making sure that everybody has access and not just treating everybody the same, but making sure that they are, they have access. Yeah. Access. Yeah. It's quite interesting because I know there's this conversation between DEI and equal access versus equal opportunity versus equal outcomes, which you cannot really control for, you can be, give equal opportunity and access. The, so expanding upon that, what role should school leaders play in promoting diversity, equity, inclusion in educational settings? What role should they take? They just need to be very mindful about it. Look at who are they hiring, especially when you have a diverse student body. If you can find those that look like the students or whether it's ethnicity or their background or whatever it might be, that way they can relate to those students a little better. And then in terms of, I'm trying to think of it without deviating on that. And then in terms of 
diversity, would you say DEI, making sure that there's training with all staff. And then even with the parents, who's at the table? Yeah, who's at the table? Who's coming at the, who's coming to the meetings? Um, if I have everybody that's PTO or PTA and it's one group, but then the others that might be bilingual parents or um, different groups, making sure that they not just have a place at the table, but they have a voice at the table. So there's that visibility aspect. And then same thing within the classroom, making sure that the students are also seeing that they're visible and not just everybody's equal, but they all have, they're all visible. Yeah. Yeah. Next, the next question I have for you is, is this with how can school leaders align with school's vision and goals with the curriculum, student outcomes and community expectations to ensure a cohesive direction? How can it say that one more time? How can... How can school leaders align the school's vision and goals with curriculum, student outcomes, and community expectations to ensure a cohesive direction? So a lot of it has to do with, okay, what does the state see? So in California, there's this, the priorities. So if there's, a, let's say there's eight priorities, and then, then it becomes the district's goals. Okay, we'll focus on not all eight, but maybe we'll focus on, or it could be all eight. And then the administrator looks at, okay, I see what the state wants. I see what the district wants. Now I need to align it. And usually there's categories that can be aligned with the state goals. And so we don't just come up with our own goals, per se. We, we try to align everything. And then, of course, there's the budget. So there's, there's the federal, state, local funds is one of it, or some of them. And it's a matter of how to allocate those monies for those areas. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a really interesting conversation. And for those individuals, they're, they're teachers aspiring to become assistant principal or principals, how should they prepare for the role? Part of it is that they can ask or let them know, that the administrators know that they are interested, that they're thinking about it. I think that's really important is to have that voice, don't wait to be tapped on the shoulder and say, hey, I think you should do it. But actually step out of that comfort zone and for those who might be shy about it and to say, hey, I'm thinking about maybe going into administration. What do you think I can do? Or are there things that I can help with or that can expose me to the different things that I don't know now? I don't know what I don't know until it's, you know exposed me to that. And the principal would probably say, yes, that's great. I'm going to have you do, how about you do the after school attendance or attendance with parents? Or how about I homework center after school, run the homework center after school program. Um, that gives them some leadership ability just outside of the classroom. And then even saying, okay, maybe you could work with your department chair, or you can be the department chair, be a co-leader of the department chair, or you can work with new teachers that are coming in and sharing best practices. So there's a lot of things that can be done in terms of um, advocating for the South. They can go into classrooms and observe other teachers and then give feedback and ask for feedback as well. So then that becomes kind of a dialogue that happens when, as an administrator, is being able to have that kind of feedback. And then also looking at the, the programs that are for the credential program. And then from there, that's this homework in itself with those programs. Mm. How can people find out more about you and reach out to you and, and, and work with you? Thank you. I'm Cynthia Rapato, and you can find me on LinkedIn under Cynthia Rapato, EDD, Cynthia Rapato. And that's also my Gmail. So Cynthia Rapato at Gmail. So those are the main ones that, and, I'm, and if you find my book, it's on Amazon. It's step up your school leadership game. So that's, I don't know if this is the show. Yeah. So step up your school leadership game. And that's my name, Cynthia Rapato. And I have an author page when you look at that book as well. Mm, yeah. Really interesting conversation. And thanks so much for coming on. And uh, for the audience, be sure to um, follow Dr. Cynthia's socials and uh, reach out to her. And thanks again. Thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed um meeting you and having time to talk about education.